Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, we're only going to cover actually two verses today. If you're a visitor, I want you to know that's not typical because we cover a lot of scripture as we should. Um, In three weeks, we've covered three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11. But because of the um, application of this, because of the pinnacle of Romans 12, uh, especially Romans 12, 1 and 2, as it relates to the rest of 11 chapters, we have to pause and really get a preaching in today on presenting our bodies a living sacrifice as we're told to do here in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. In Romans 12, there are four major sections. I know you guys who've been in all these studies will memorize this. You guys are probably experts by now of the book of Romans. There's four major sections. Um, We are entering into Romans 12, the fourth section. The first one is the wrath of God. Second one is the grace of God or the love of God. Uh, Third one is the plan of God. Fourth one is the will of God here in Romans 12 as we pick up through the rest. And really that is a step-by-step process for us to learn from the scripture's example on how we are to present the gospel to those around us. And every Christian should be presenting the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ on a regular basis. And unfortunately, guys, you know the statistics in Protestantism is only around 8% of, of people share their faith on a regular basis. It's a shame. It's a scourge upon the church. Let that not be said of Calvary Chapel Eldoret. I don't think you guys... Uh, fit that mold. At least 9% of us are out sharing the gospel. That was kind of a joke, but uh, I hope it's more. So that's a good way. We present people with the wrath of God. And let's not sugarcoat it. Romans 1 was rough. It was a tough thing. Humanity is all assigned to being guilty. And guys, this is one of the great messages of the entire Bible from the time that Adam and Eve fell into sin, became uh, aware that they were naked and shame came into their life and every single person born all the way down to you and me are born with original sin. We're wicked. We're sinful. This this is so important, guys. Guys. Uh, It's so important that we have to be careful how we raise our children and speaking how good they are. You guys know what we do when our children do something good. What do we say? Oh, good boy. Good girl. You're such a good boy. You're such a good girl. That's not necessarily wrong, but they need more information than that. We do want to encourage the good acts that they do. It's important to praise our children and tell them we're proud of them. But I noticed when I had my three children, that I was always doing it. It's like, oh, you're, you're good, uh, good girl, good boy. And then I, I realized, well, I also need to tell them they're bad. Not necessarily when they do something bad. We need to correct, yes. But even when they're doing good, it's like, yes, you're a good boy, but you're really wicked on the inside. Okay, you need Jesus. Not kidding you. I did not let the doctors clean my children from the time they were plucked out of the womb before they heard the gospel. And I had to fight these doctors. These doctors in Kenya are very pushy, aren't they? And the nurses, I even discovered ladies, you know, the nurses can slap you when you're making noise when you're pregnant. Have you ladies' experiences? I wanted, when I found this out, I wanted my full-time ministry to start slapping the nurses that are slapping the women who are giving birth. But vengeance belongs to the Lord, not to me. And, and, and so I was fighting with these doctors like, no, you're not cleaning him. I'm talking about the bloody child. I whispered the gospel in their ear. Do you know what I started with? You're a sinful person. <laughs> That's the first words my children heard. But God loves you. Died on the cross for you. Wants you to be born again. They got the gospel. They got the Romans road, guys. 
That's what they got. We got to be careful how much we pronounce goodness. And as I said last week, isn't it interesting that the most plain evidence in the world, it's the number one thing that we can say about humanity is that humanity is evil, is the most debated anthropological issue in the world. Everybody proclaims their own goodness. All of this this, this nonsense about how good we really are. No, we're desperately wicked and we need Jesus Christ to become a new creation. And, and so you, you go through that process. And in evangelicalism, if that first step is skipped, we have a real problem. If we just go to how much God loves you and wants to help you and, and not mention sin, not mention repentance, then you'll have a lot of people follow after Christ, um, not realizing from which or for how much he has saved them from. He saved them from their sin. And you learn this throughout the New Testament. Do you remember when the uh, Apostle Peter preached the first gospel message, having been given the keys to the kingdom to unlock the door of the church? When the church was born, that's what it means, by the way, in Matthew 16, he preaches the gospel. One of the most pointed things that he said on the day of Pentecost was, you have crucified the Son of Man. You've done it. He wasn't talking to the people who actually drove the nails or Judas who went and kissed Jesus, showing love with hypocrisy as it's going to mention. He didn't do that. He, um, he's talking to people who are responsible of crucifying God-made flesh because of their sin. It's a very important issue. So this outline of Romans is obviously genius because God wrote it through the Apostle Paul. You have the wrath of God, but wrath without telling people how much God loves them is also an injustice to humanity. God's angry. We don't want to get the picture of an angry uh, God. Now, God is angry, and he will judge sinners, but he's not angry with his children. He loves them. He wants to save them from their sin. And you go through this process, and as we come to Romans 12, we enter the fourth uh, um, uh, outline here uh, all the way through to the chapter into the chapter 16, the will of God for our lives. Now, this is extremely important because we have many therefore statements throughout Scripture, but in the book of Romans, up to this point, we have four transitional therefore statements, four majors. Number one transitional therefore statement is found in Romans 3. It's the therefore of condemnation. The Bible says in Romans 3.20, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is, if not the greatest central subject, the second greatest central subject in the book of Romans. In other words, the nation of Israel, the religion of Judaism, you have got it wrong. And it's not only a central subject for the Pauline epistles and the book of Romans, it's a central subject in the New Testament, even in the first and greatest preaching of Jesus Christ our Lord, the preaching of the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus Christ said, You've heard it said before not to commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you have lusted after somebody who's, uh, who's not your wife or husband is the idea, you're guilty of adultery. You're guilty before God. God has a higher standard of righteousness and holiness than mankind does. And God our, and our Lord Jesus Christ was coming along saying, hey guys, you misinterpreted your responsibility to the Ten Commandments. Now, yes, you were supposed to make every judicial effort to enforce the laws that God established through a nation. But your interpretation of God's law in the Old Testament has rendered some of you innocent or made righteous through your own actions and some of you guilty. That's a misinterpretation. You got it wrong. All are guilty. 
all have fallen short of the glory of God. All need Jesus Christ. And so that three chapters of this, you guys are all condemned if you're not born again. Because you're guilty of sin. Every single person, both Jew and Gentile. And then you have the second transitional therefore statement. The good news comes to us. It's the therefore of justification. Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been justified, made clean, washed because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice. The very thing that we remember today in communion. The third transition, uh, transitional therefore statement is Romans 8.1, that famous therefore of exoneration. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And guys, this is, I know we talked about it. This is a bit of a review, but this is so important to realize that those who are born again, those who are the children of God, who are constantly walking in guilt and shame and condemnation, it is, in reality, an illusion. You actually do not have condemnation. If you've been washed with your robes as white as wool, you have none. And, and and listen, don't think that I'm light on sin. We need to pursue holiness. We need to repent of our sins. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. But we do understand for those who are pursuing after God, we still fall short of the glory of God. We're still sinful. And though we don't practice habitual sin as believers, and habitual sin is actually saying that sin is not evil, sin is good. It's not always failing because then we would all be in a lot of trouble. None of us would go to heaven. So I'm not being light on sin, but understand that where sin abounds, what abounds much more? Grace. And that our sins, for those who are children of God, are forgiven, will be forgiven, past, present, and future. And wouldn't it be a terrible religion and feeling to think, oh, my good house has to outweigh my bad? I mean, we get dressed in robes of white. You know, and we, we, we appear before Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is an examining us without blemish? No, we're without blemish because Christ was without blemish. And, and can you imagine how scary it would be, ladies and gentlemen, to be examined, you personally, by the Lord Jesus Christ on Judgment Day? Oh, oh, I see a stain here. You didn't use that Kenyan detergent, did you? You watch pornography even after you got saved. There's condemnation. That's not Christendom. That's Judaism. That's Islam. That's bad news. That's bad news. No. He doesn't examine us personally. He sees the robes of white. He sees Jesus Christ covering us. The imputation of righteousness upon us. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus to the glory of God. How incredible is that? That's good news. Guys, if you're thinking about if you're good enough to get to heaven, you're in big trouble because you're not. And that's why these two verses here in Romans 12, 1 and 2 are so important. It is the therefore of consecration. Because the wrath of God is upon me because I'm sinner, but because of the grace and love of Jesus Christ, I've been forgiven. Therefore, I'm justified. Therefore, there's no condemnation. 
What is my reasonable service to Jesus Christ? It is to dedicate my life. It is to consecrate my life. I am a bond slave. My body doesn't belong to me. My mind doesn't belong to me. My soul doesn't belong to me. My life doesn't belong to me. It is his. We've been bought with the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Our life is not our own. To him we belong. All of that stuff. And, and, and that's where we come to. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is what? A reasonable service. Now, let's just do this verse. We have a big problem in many churches, and I'm not one of those doomsdayers, uh, every church is bad but ours. No, there's amazing churches around the world and amazing men and women of God around the world. But in general terms, guys, we have a major problem when it comes to church. And the biggest problem in my estimation is the lack of amount of scripture being taught to the congregation. People aren't expositional anymore like the expositional revival of the Protestant Reformation. People are getting little sermonettes on Sunday morning about how to be a better you. What kind of nonsense is this? I want me, I want you to die. And I want Christ to live in your life so that we can truly be effective and walk in power. And, And we see that it's reasonable, and the problem is it won't be reasonable if we didn't study 11 chapters of the book of Romans. It won't be reasonable if we didn't go through the examination of the condition of man, the study of anthropology as we've been studying in Romans 1, 2, and 3. It's not reasonable to present our body as a living sacrifice if we don't realize how amazing his love is truly to love somebody as wicked as me. Becomes very unreasonable. And guys, not every church my mom took me to, and she was trying. We had a messed up family. Drunkenness plagued our family from down from my dad to all of the... Uh, to, to, to most of my uncles and <laughs> all this stuff. I can't even appreciate how important grandparents are because I've never met any of mine. And some of you can relate to that, but you know what? I made a choice to rebel against God. I am not a victim of my circumstances. God gave me the opportunity to get out and I chose sin. I'm responsible for it. No matter what happened to me growing up. But my mom took me to, there was one good church, but most of them was, I'm growing up, I'm a young guy, I'm a kid, and you know what? I just, all I heard is fornicators will, you know, go to hell. And, and it's actually true. A fornicator will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but there's a better explanation than leaving it like that. It means people who haven't been forgiven of their fornications because we're all, as we learned on the Sermon on the Mount, guilty of it. In other words, everything the preachers that I heard growing up were telling me to do was everything, or telling me not to do, was everything I wanted to do. At 12, 13, I come to that, I don't want to describe myself as hormonal, but you know, puberty. Voice starts cracking. Eee. That's humiliating for a guy, right, guys? Some of your voices are still cracking. You need to get some more testosterone flowing. And and all of a sudden, these desires come in, these attractions, and the pastor leaves the explanation as just don't do it. And then the bracelets went around the world. Did WWJD come to Kenya? We get these bracelets. What would Jesus do? Let me tell you what he would do. He would explain his word a lot better than you're doing. He would tell me, yes, I understand you have sexual desires. I understand you have desires for pleasure. We all do. 
Kenyans, did you talk about sexual desires with your parents? Not a one of you, did you? Kenyans, did you talk about sexual desires with your pastors? Not a one of you, did you? You won't stop talking about them with me. You are a sick people. That was supposed to laugh a lot harder than that. And here's the point. We all are. And instead of giving a proper explanation of God's word, we're left confused. We're left like, what, WWJD? You know, when my mom gave me a purity ring, I was already impure. I was already, I had lost that precious thing that God wanted me to keep until I was married, and that was my virginity. I didn't have the heart to tell her. Here's the point. Why is it reasonable? It's reasonable because of how Christ has been presented for 11 chapters. If we go and just, guys, this is terrible in parenting, by the way. Just don't do this. 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 Don't do that. Don't do this. Oh, that was wrong. Oh, you're bad. Don't do this. And all that we hear growing up is all the laws that we're breaking. We get frustrated. Now, guys, don't hear me wrong. We need to talk about what is wrong and tell our children not to do it. But let me tell you something. Show them who Jesus Christ is and how much more excellent and beautiful he is above all the desires of pleasure. That's the key. Oh, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up, I was doing drugs at 11, heroin and co- crack, shooting it up intravenously at 14. You think I'm supposed to hide that from my children? Would you tell your children what you've done? Don't shake your head. I told them. I told them. You know, one day we're doing our devotions, all my kids in the room. And they, you know, kids pick things up. They're smart, guys. They're sponges. And, and they, they came to the question, you know, it was better than the bir- birds and the bees. You know, that still is a hard thing with daughters. You guys who get children, one day, if you ever get married, you'll realize what I'm talking about. But one of my kids asked, hey, he said, hey, dad, you used to drink? Yeah. Dad, I heard that you did drugs. Somebody said that. Did you do drugs? Yeah. What are drugs? So I had to sit down with my kids. Like, you know what? Your dad was a drunkard. I drunk from the age of 12, 13 years old, all the way through till 21. I developed such an addiction to alcohol that when I stopped through stints in jail, I had terrible withdrawals. I laid it out for my kids. I said, you guys got to understand something about your dad. I rebelled against God as a teenager, as a young boy. I had every opportunity to choose Christ and I chose pleasure and it destroyed my life but Jesus Christ saved me from my sins. I told him about who he is. You know, I I, I had my son tell me uh, a year ago, he, he said, Dad, you know what my favorite scripture is? I said, what? He says, when Jesus told Pilate that he had no power except it's been given to him from above. I said, oh, Zeph, that's one of my favorite scriptures too. And listen to me, guys. This isn't my daughter's favorite scripture. I know you hear me preach that all the time. You know why this is Zeph's favorite scripture? Because he has seen Jesus Christ for who he really is, a, the, the most courageous, brave man who's ever walked the face of the earth. You get in front of a governor who has the power to crucify you right after you've been beaten all night and you tell him he has no power. That's courage. Men, we need to know who Jesus Christ is. We need to tell our children, men and women, who Jesus Christ is, not just all the don'ts. Because if you tell them the don'ts and you don't give them the do's and describe to them, tell them how worthy he is to be followed, to deny yourself, they're not going to deny themselves. You've just skipped Romans 1 through 11. You've gone to Romans 12. It's a problem. 
let me illustrate this. And I've done this for years, but let me illustrate this. If I come up to one of you guys and I say, hey, I have a, I have a foot fungus. <laughs> it's yellow and green and black down there. It's really gross, but it hurts. Would you mind washing my feet for me? Just get down on your knees and wash them. You guys would say, don't be spiritual on me. You would say what? No, thank you, honesty. No. What? Maybe you would ask your own question. Why would I wash your feet? What, what should I do? Why should I wash your feet? But if I presented it in a different way, and I said, hey, I just put 10 million shillings in your bank account. You see that Land Cruiser Prado out there? It's yours. <laughs> and tomorrow you're flying to Paris for a two-week vacation. <laughs> would you wash my feet? You'd wash it in a second. You'd be like, that's all? That's it? You want me to kill somebody? I'll do anything. Why? Because in light of what I've done, your most reasonable service is to wash the feet. It's reasonable. The greatest problem in our church is that people aren't being shown the beauty of Christ as the word of God is not taught expositionally throughout our churches. It's the problem, guys. It's so reasonable to serve him. It's so reasonable to worship him. It's so reasonable to lift our voices, to give our lives, to acknowledge his worth. It's so reasonable. I understand we have desires for sin. I understand the battle. I've been through it. That's how I can understand. I know what you're going through, but understand this that he's so much greater than giving in to your desires. Just hold out. Say no for the reason of his worth, not for the reason of just having the power to say no. Nobody has that power. But when we come into a relationship with him, we love him. And if we love him, we will obey him. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, it is true to, to understand the interpretation of this. The bodies it is speaking um, about mind, soul, and strength. To, to love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, and that's what most commentators agree on. But it, I, I think it is a mistake to neglect our physical bodies in the rendering of this scripture. I think it's a mistake. So let's come to that first. Our physical bodies matter so much that we are also to present them as a living sacrifice. And one of the great reasons why this needs to be mentioned is because religions, all the way back to the time Paul is writing this, and one of the reasons he words it this way is because of a Gnostic belief that our physical bodies have no effect on our spiritual lives. That is nonsense. Our physical bodies will have an effect on our spiritual lives. So much so that the Apostle Paul speaks to the Corinthian church and actually says what to me is still a bit of a mystery, that when you are, or not you, because you guys don't do this, but when, when someone goes into a prostitute, they are connecting the Holy Spirit to a prostitute if they're born again and the Holy Spirit lives in them. Is that a bit mysterious? Yes, but it is still what the word of God says. Our physical bodies ought to be given as a living sacrifice in all manner. So before we go to the mind, understand, try to keep your physical body in subjection to Christ, starting with the beginning of your day when you wake up. Commit yourself to have devotions in the morning before you go out. And listen, I know this may sound a little legalistic, but I think it's true, so it's not legalistic. Because if it's true, it's not legalistic. It's people like, I read my Bible at night. That's when I do that. Okay, I guess you have enough strength to get out through the day then. You devote yourself to, to God in the morning. 
I'm not saying you got to fast and pray for three hours. Guys, read the word of life when you wake up. Oh God, I need you today. I'm, a, I'm poor in spirit. I'm a beggar. I'm coming to you. Oh, why do wars start according to James? Because you're fighting each other and you have pride. That's why war starts. Like, yeah, I got pride. That's why I'm fighting with that person. Lord, forgive me. We need that. And you know what it involves? Waking up a little bit before you go to work. Just put your body into subjection. It's like every night when we wrap ourselves once again in, in, in our mother's womb with the blanket, it's hard to get out in the morning, isn't it? So warm. Put your body into discipline, subjection to Christ. Say, okay, nope. If I don't read and pray, I'm going to be in trouble. Get up. Get your body up. Get it moving. I, I know to some of you I'm still a young guy, but I'm at that age where everything's snap, crackling, and popping when I wake up in the morning. You know, I jumped in a pool a few weeks ago. You guys know how sound is weirdly heightened when you're in a pool? I dove in a pool and started swimming, and my body was cracking throughout the pool. It's getting harder at times to wake up. I got to do it. I got to put my body in subjection. You know what else, guys? I believe us men should be strong physically. Not for the sake of looking good, cool, but using our strength to help the helpless, to help the weak, which is women and children. And women, don't, don't be feminized on me. You're not as strong as men, just admit it. I, I don't even care if some of you have sat on men before, like that saying, uh, she, she will sit on me. I don't even know what that means. Are we talking physical sitting or what? Men have... Uh, um, uh, quadruple the body of muscle mass that women do. We are supposed to use that strength to serve women and children. And, uh, please, may no member of Calvary Chapel ever be caught having their women carry all the groceries out of the grocery whore, uh, whore, grocery whore, grocery store, and the men's hands are empty. I mean, she's she's carrying everything. She's got all of her hands, and because of the skill of women, which, by the way, is incredibly impressive, African ladies, you have stuff on your head, too. You're like, boom. That's impressive. But you know what's not impressive, men? When you're standing right next to her, making her carry everything. I have seen men holding doors open when women are carrying furniture out of stores. In Kenya. Oh, it makes me angry, to be honest with you. But Calvary Chapel men don't do this, right? Okay, well, two women clapped, so that means some of you are still doing this, men. We're supposed to use our strength. Men, learn, do some push-ups. Don't have those little spindly arms. And listen, if you do have spindly arms, at least learn some Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something, some karate. Well, you present your body a living sacrifice. Have, have a good diet. You know, there are hundreds of health issues for the very reason of not drinking enough water. If you're having chronic head, headaches, yes, I'm not saying everything relates to water, if you're not drinking 12 to 15 glasses of water and Kenyan chai doesn't count as good as it is, a day, you're going to have health issues. Drink water. Present your body a living sacrifice. And even more important, because um, physical uh, exercise profits little, and that doesn't mean it has little profit. It means it profits little in comparison to spiritual exercise. But if your mind is sharp and healthy, you'll be a greater tool in the hand of the Lord. But we move on to uh, your bodies, but also do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's interesting that Paul is saying that considering in the previous chapter, he says, and this is one of the reasons why he's saying it in this chapter, that the nation of Israel has a passion. They have a zeal for God without what? Knowledge. They're not using their minds. 
their hearts, they have this passion for the Lord, but they're not acknowledging the logic and the, the, uh, of, the, of interpreting Old Testament scripture. They haven't seen the sufferings of the Messiah in Isaiah 53. They haven't seen the sufferings of Messiah in Psalm chapter 2. They're not thinking about it. Why? Because the desires of their heart of selfish ambition and self-exaltation have blinded their minds of what is true. That's why. They had to use their minds. They had to present their minds as a living sacrifice. Do you guys know that we are called to be non-conformist? You know we're called to that? And you know what prevents us from being non-conformist mostly is fear. We care a lot about what people think. Another way of uh, 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 becoming a non-conformist, which we're called to do, is, is believing propaganda. Just believing everything you hear. This is, guys, like I said earlier, if you just walked away from here and never watched CNN again, I would consider this a victory today. I mean, the, 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 we're talking about Doctrines of demons rule the news. Demons are in charge of the White House. They're in charge of the State House in Kenya. Demons are in charge of these things. The prince and the power of the air that works in the sons of of disobedience. Where does he work? In the sons of disobedience. I... I am fully confident that Nancy Pelosi is demon-possessed, and I'm not even joking. Amen. Yes, thank you, whoever said that. Some of you are going to walk away. He's getting political, and it's just not right. I don't care. These people are mutilating children. And it's coming to Kenya, and it's here, abortions. They're mutilating children. And the church, we can't talk about it? Is this some sort of conformist view? Is this some sort of nonsense? We can't talk about it as the church? The church is in the condition is in because they stop talking about these things. Stop promoting the truth. Presenting their mind as a living sacrifice. Guys, go back 50 years when it comes to entertainment and the arts. All the way from chick flicks, which I believe to be demonic, all the way to karate movies, you have some wise sage, some person who has the pinnacle of wisdom in those movies that will come at the most pivotal spot in the movie. And it has been said, this very thing I'm about to say, in hundreds if not thousands of movies, and they go up to like, and it's supposed to be this profound moment. The music starts, you know, some pattern. They're like, you know what your problem is? You don't know what to do because you're thinking with this and not with this. You've seen this in movies, right? And then they're like, and then the moment comes, you're right. Now I know what to do. I know to leave my husband and fall in love with this man. doctrines of demons. Are we supposed to be conformed to such things? Oh, they make rebellion look good, don't they? Guys, I'm with my children. I got to watch what they watch. And some of it is so catchy that if I don't find myself cognitively using my brain, I'll get swept up and, you know, uh, what can I say except you're welcome That music in that movie is so good. Moana, you guys know? You've seen it. Did you correct it when you were watching it with your kids? My finger is on the pause button. Pause. What's wrong with this child? She's a brat. That's right. Good kid. uh, Look, she's disobeying her father again. It makes disobedience to parents look like she's the hero of the world. Does it not? Be a nonconformist. Don't give in to that. Correct it. Speak against it. 
And guys, it seems so innocent, does it? Especially with the music. You know, away, away, you know, and those guys, they're muscular and they're, you know, they're sailing. This is awesome. No, it is a rebellious movie. And I'm not sitting there saying, don't watch. I watched it again because it's so awesome. But it is a teaching point. It is a learning point so that my kids can use their minds as nonconformist. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Use your brain. It's a powerful weapon in the hands of God. We got to be ready with answers, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to be unpopular if you speak the truth, guys. John chapter 16, Christ said, the world is going to hate you. Have you been hated lately? If you haven't, you're not speaking the truth. Are you giving in to what the world thinks of Israel right now? If you are, you are a conformist. Don't ever compare Judaism with Hamas. That is ridiculous. And you know what? It burdens my heart. I'm not trying to be controversial. It it burdens my heart to think that there are people in the church of Jesus Christ, the real one, not the Latter-day Saints across the street, the real one, are beginning to hate Israel. Pray for them. Watch them because they are the epicenter of all prophecy to yet be fulfilled. Are are we conformist? Do we go out and say, you know what? I hear what you guys are saying at work, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this about the nation of Israel. Did you hear about his covenant with Abraham? Did you read Romans 11? Because we just studied at our church. God said that he foreknew all of their rebellion. And yes, they're a wicked people. He foreknew it, but he still made a covenant with Abraham. It's an everlasting covenant. Wait a minute. Um, actually, Jesus Christ says about marriage that let no man tear asunder what God has, God has put together. Uh, it says it in, in Matthew's uh, gospel, in Matthew, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, in other parts. Wait a minute. And when you speak that word that you've learned in your mind that has become very, you're committed to in your heart, you're going to have people hate you for it but you will be the salt and light preserving the atmosphere that you live in if you speak that truth, but you got to use your mind. Guys, if we don't know the first 11 chapters, it's not going to be reasonable to present our bodies and our minds as a living sacrifice that we may prove, the Bible says, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is it proven in your life? Nonconformity? Is it proven? Is transformity, being transformed, is that evident? Did you really leave your life of sin? Or did you just add Jesus Christ as a decorative addition to make you look good in this Christian nation of Kenya? Like a necklace. You know, I can wear this and still go to hell. And it's a cross. Is my life really transformed? Am I committed to him? Is my body his? Are my finances his? Is my mind his? Is my time his? Is my heart his? Is all of my strength his? That's what it means to be transformed. I want to read to you the J.B. Phillips translation, which I found to be very Enlightening. It says now, in light of, therefore, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brother, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove and practice 
that the plan of God for you is good and meets all his demands and move towards the goal of true maturity. Isn't that a good translation? With eyes wide open. Why are our eyes wide open? Calvary? Because we just studied 11 chapters. That's why our eyes are wide open. May I never commit the crime of just telling you to pre present your bodies as a living sacrifice without presenting the beauty of Jesus Christ to you first. Amen? Go present your bodies living sacrifice. As the worship team comes up, go present it. Go out in that world and, and with joy and with glee say, my life is not my own, but it belongs to somebody who is beautiful and who is worthy for me to deny all of my personal desires and to follow him with my whole life. My life is his. And when you do that, you know what you're going to do? You're going to spend more time helping people. You're going to share the gospel more. You're going to be more generous. You're going to lose some sleep because Jesus Christ is being served. We just had a mission team, worship team, come on up. Don't be scared. We just had a mission team from Miami. They had flights canceled. They were delayed a couple days. You know what? They wanted to be here on time for Sunday because they were doing the Sunday school. So instead of taking a flight from Nairobi to here, which, would have, which was the plan, and instead of resting in Nairobi, they left Nairobi airport in the middle of floods from Nairobi to here at 1 a.m. And they got here before first service today. And they're out there serving our children. They look like their passport picture right now. That's how exhausted they look. You know, we had volunteers. They're presenting their body. We have at least 20 to 30 volunteers. I don't even know how they got here. Kenyans, you guys here every day of the week. And I'm, don't feel bad if you don't volunteer. I know many of you have jobs and you are doing things. Uh, I'm not trying to put shame. Uh, it would be wrong for some of you to leave your job and volunteer here. But guys, we have 20, 30 people here every day serving. This is incredible. Presenting their bodies a living sacrifice. Present your body a living sacrifice at work. May you be the one who's not late at work, Christian. May you be the one going and serving others. I don't care if you're the boss. If you're the boss, you have a greater responsibility to serve those under you than those who are under you serving you. Present your body a living sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you... This famous portion of scripture that's quoted, has been quoted by so many people. It's written on our walls. But do we really understand the first 11 chapters? And I think we do at Calvary Chapel as we've studied them over the months. Please pour out your spirit and accomplish in your power and your ability to clarify your word all of the mistakes I have made and all the lack of wisdom I have, please, Holy Spirit, make your word known to the hearts and minds of everyone in this room. Please, please, Lord. We love you. Lord, we're praying for a revival this week. We're praying, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would pour out upon us at this conference that before all the visitors from around the world come, that we as members of Calvary Chapel, we would repent first. That we would soften our hearts first. And that we would worship you with all the knowledge and the zeal and the love that we can muster through your power this coming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We need you, Lord, and we're desperate for you. Save us. I pray, Lord, if somebody's not saved in this room right now, that they would be born again. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.